and welcome to Varm Vlog. And today, from the grim darkness of the 21st century, we're going to talk about the grim darkness of the 20th. Um, one of the, the, the one of the underlying theses of my show is that we're not really in decline. It's more that everything has mostly been crap forever. Um, <laughs> like uh and, it's just a different flavor <laughs> yeah like and, and with with the exception of like the mid the, the post-war social compact probably being for for both the capitalists and the communists that if you were in the developing uh, in the developed world and not in the developing world probably the best period of human history you know that you could have existed in <laughs> right um, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and as hurt. long as you're, that's a, it's an important caveat. As long as you're in the developed the world. world, right? Yeah. Right. If you're in the developing world and trying to develop, there's a very good chance the developed world is going to kill you, mm -hmm. or at least get you stuck in some debt trap. Um, yeah. <laughs> the middle income. Uh, yeah. Uh, problem was, as they say in uh, both geopolitics and and classical uh, neoclassical economics. Um, Today we're going to talk about the other side of German reaction from the early 20th century. Um, and most people know about the fascist, although poorly. Um, yeah, they, they know about that word. Yeah. <laughs> they throw it around a lot. Yeah, they um, do. <laughs> and I wanted to explore with you the German conservative revolutionaries and the German romantic revolutionaries. Um which I guess that the German Romantic revolutionaries are even the nationalists who turn more and more conservative after 1848. Right. Um, because in a lot of ways, I actually think they're better parallels to some things we actually see developing on the right now. And we're not going to like make a one-to-one -one analogy because it, that wouldn't hold. Like no. the right now does not exist in the context of the, of the conservative revolution in Germany. But there for is one, a... it has like nothing close to the rich like literary tradition that the oh, conservative yeah. revolution had. <laughs> yeah, but, but, yes, there's no there's no Ernst Younger for yeah for MAGA communism or for the alt right. Um, yeah, or even uh, like a Nietzsche figure, you know. Right. I mean, yeah. the best they're going to do is decontextualized readings of uh, Michelle Welbeck. That's like yeah. what you're going to get. So they, they got Dinesh D'Souza, right? Yeah, oh. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, uh, so you guys know Chris uh, as the voice of Regrettable Century, one of the three or four voices, depending on the time period you're listening to the show. Yeah, with your brother um, and Kevin. Um, but what many of you don't know about Chris is in addition to being a former uh, Trotskyist who's trying to figure out what does it mean to be a Marxist in this post-sectarian world, uh, Chris is also a scholar. Um, yeah, I'm trying to be. Yep. And you are uh, in your beginning, your PhD candidacy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh you studied the German Romantic Revolutionaries. Uh, yeah, my that was my focus for my master's was right. specifically the, the conservative revolution. And uh, I was focusing on the concept of what was referred to then as German socialism, um, okay. meaning, you know, the backwards looking um, romantic anti-capitalism that like formed the foundation for the conservative revolution. So yeah, yeah, I did a lot of a lot of study on folkish, um, folkish nationalism, conservative revolution, basically like the the political milieu from which the Nazi movement emerges triumphant and then swallows up all the rest of it. Right. Either through by having everyone join them or by you know putting them in concentration camps. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that. Uh is hard to deal with about the about the the german revolution and these other um reactionary figures from germany in the early 20th century is they're always read as nazis and right. often that's really confusing and and i'm not even just meaning like in the strasserist nazi sense they're not even that like yeah. there's something else um 
Spingler is one of is the one I think people know about, uh, and then Ernst Younger. Um, yeah, Younger and Spengler, probably the two most famous. Mm-hmm. But the most you read know, in English too. Yeah, the most read in English. You know, I, th- I think that if you had to pick a top three of the most influential conservative revolutionaries, quote unquote, they would be the uh, you know Spengler, Spengler, Younger, and Arthur Muller Vandenbroek. Mm who's the guy that came up with the idea or, or coined the term the Third Reich, which was, uh, you know, in his book, Das Dritte Reich. So one thing that I find interesting about this movement is that if you look at contemporary far-right movements of the European New Right variety, so if you look at, like, mm-hmm. Greca from France, which is, you know, uh, Alain de Beniste, yeah. um, uh, or... In some ways, we can look at Eurasianisms, a little bit it pulls from Germany. They don't actually pull from fascists directly, with the exception of uh, everybody loves Carl Smith. Yeah. But everybody tries to use Carl Smith. That's a, that's a whole other podcast day. But yeah, well, I mean, he's important to understand if. Yeah. But yes. I don't necessarily know if he's important to like draw like uh inspiration from <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The, the the agamben attempt to recontextualize him seems uh problematic to say the least yeah but uh i think that is it is interesting to me that when we talk about like a lot of the the new nationalist right in europe we tend to think most of them are explicit neo-nazis right and i think enzo traverso is very good on this that's not really true in a lot of cases that and what they what a lot of these groups explicitly try to link their history to uh when they aren't explicit in history uh neo-nazis are either the either the kind of dissident fascist figures in italy and in spain Mm -hmm. you know like uh you know kind of idiosyncratic one-offs from the phalange or from the italian fascist or to the German uh, conservative revolutionaries like that, like younger gets brought up a lot more than Hitler in these circles. And so yeah. younger is safe because yeah. he's got something of a redemption arc, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, he becomes some kind of vaguely right wing anarchist. Mm-hmm. Um he, conde- he, be- he condemns the state as, as a whole. Then if you get a little deeper, they'll get Spingler, because Spingler, you can legitimately say, well, he's an ethnicist, but he's explicitly not a racialist. Yeah, um, and he gets, you know, gets shit for criticizing the Nazis while mm-hmm. they're in power. So did Junger as well, but Junger's get his, his credibility during the Nazi regime is uh, reduced by the fact that he joins the military and serves as a, a an officer in Paris during the occupation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, uh, they, they, those figures are, I don't, I don't think it's so much even that it's safe. So like people will cynically use them so much as that they see that like, there's no use in biological racism. Right. right. And, you know, the, the Nazi ideas of biological racism just don't hold any sway to people. And, uh, I think that the ideas of ethnic supremacy still do, and you can get that out of these people. Right. Yeah. And I think I think people need to like ponder that movement because we've seen that shift even in the American far right context where there was a an explicit white nationalist trend in the in the late aughts, aught teens that has mm-hmm. some roots going all the way back to the 1950s uh, to George Lincoln Rockwell. But there's also been an explicit move within that right to move it from racial nationalism um to what we might call as cultural 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 linguistic nationalism yeah um that is more than willing to put you know a few people of color in leadership positions and um and sometimes the 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 uh, criterion for belonging is ethnic and sometimes it's religio ethnic um and there's a spectrum. So while everybody was focusing on people like Richard Spencer, they were ignoring the the beginnings of like the national conservative movement, which is really yeah. the intellectual core of this, or the fact that like the Proud Boys were diversifying their their ranks. Um, 
uh, that's also been true for more serious groups like three percenters. Yeah. Uh, and they've been moving away from groups, uh, you know, that are more explicitly uh, neo-Nazi. Um, the yeah. thing about Spencer, too, that is funny is like he had almost no cachet on the right. He's almost entirely like a uh, a figure that was created by, you know, mainstream media. He he had like a very small group of people around him and his uh, in his little think tank that he created. But like nobody else on the on the on the alt right like paid much attention to him at all, or even the mainstream right. And that was yeah. despite having like in paleo conservative uh, and new American nationalist circles having the pedigree of having Paul Gottfried as an advisor, um, and having briefly worked at the National Review when he when he was kicked out of the National Review, uh, not National Review. Excuse me? Rearrange the conservative, the American conservative. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like this is actually, I'm, I'm repeating what happened to a lot of people sympathetic to this and, and, and the American uh, 80s and 90s, the paleocons who got kicked out of the National Review, like Joe Sobrin and uh, Sam Francis. And what Spencer did was find this really extreme, but really innocuously named think tank called the National Policy Institute in South Carolina. And kind of took it over, and then tried to rebrand it with the alt with the alt right moniker. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one who came up with the moniker. Yeah. Um, and it was very crypto in the beginning, and then by 2013, it was very out. But he was already like a contentious figure and kind of laughed at in these circles. Mm -hmm. The harder neo Nazis thought he was too soft. And the paleo conservatives thought he was too extreme or too are too vocal about what he believed. Yeah. So, you know, what's funny is uh, whenever I was I was I picked up a book on the conservative revolution uh, mm -hmm. written by this guy named like Armin Moeller, I think. Yeah, Armin Moeller. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he's a Swiss, um, you know, paleocon type who is very sympathetic to the. Uh, German revolution, the, the, uh, uh, conservative revolutionaries. And he yeah. wrote a book on it. And, uh, I looked, I, I didn't realize this at the time, but I was looking through it whenever I was uh, sourcing it for a paper and uh, I looked at the publisher and it was Radix. And then I looked and it was, uh, it had been, um, edited by Richard Spencer's wife. So mm -hmm. I was like, Oh shit, Richard Spencer published this book. Yeah. I'm a Mueller's book was it the two right-wing publishing houses that often reprint this stuff is either going to be Arcos, which is, uh, I believe, out of India, um, even though it's, I believe, also run by American, or Redix. Yeah. Um, yeah, see, this is it right here. Yeah. And then I, I, I didn't notice it, but it's got, like, a little, you know, oak leaf. Yep. On the... On the That's Redix. Redix. So... Funny story about that, then we'll actually get to the topic. Reddix was, there was a split amongst the alt-right where a bunch of different racists took the name from Spencer, and he rebranded himself as a, as the Reddix Journal, and only got called alt-right again when liberals started picking it up, like, yeah. four years later. Um, it, it is, um, it, I have spent way too much of my, my early 30s tracing these people because i was parallel to them in my 20s yeah um but yeah so one of the things i find fascinating about this is these guys are really influential on a certain strain of the american far right mm -hmm. but nobody else really knows about them i mean even i think strasser like people know who ernst younger is people know who oswald spingler is but they don't really know the political movement that they were tied into. Right. So what is the context of German socialism or the, or the conservative revolutionaries? Well, okay. So after the German defeat in world war one, right, you've got this layer of people that are primarily out of the middle class and they're led almost exclusively by former soldiers that uh, have like really had been become really disenchanted with the idea of the monarchy but not disenchanted with the idea of authoritarian leadership, right? Like, uh, so they're into the, into the mixture of the swirling milieu of like Weimar politics. Uh, you have several intellectuals 
who aren't just isolated intellectuals at all, by the way, like I, like uh, Ernst Jünger and uh, several of his the people around him, they get uh, co-opted or they, they get called into the um, the Stahlhelm, which is the, you know, 400,000 members or, you know, 200,000 members strong uh, veterans organization that funds them to have a newspaper. And uh, they, you know, they, they have all of these ideas about synthesizing right and left, trying to like create a homogenous Volksgemeinschaft, right? The people's community that would bridge the chasms between the rich and the poor, just like it was in the military, right? That's like a lot, a lot of the conservative revolutionaries, I think all of, all of the, all of the ones that served in the military anyway, bring back this idea of like trench socialism, right? The, the idea that there's, once you put on the uniform, the only difference between you and the person next to you is the rank and that's earned, which is, of course, it's bullshit because, you know, almost exclusively the upper ranks of the military were aristocracy. But, you know, let's forget about that for the sake of uh, describing the conservative revolutionaries. So they have this like idea of like socialism and society structured as military structure and voice figures like Ernst Jünger and uh, Arthur Muller Vandenbroek and uh, Oswald Spengler, who of course wasn't, you know, a combatant in the first world war, but still had like very similar ideas. And that's the thing about the conservative revolution is it's like a, a, a very, very uh, large category with lots of conflicting ideas within it. Like you could call, I would say anyone from Spengler to um, Strasser, part of the conservative revolutionary movement. Yeah, and, Heidegger is sometimes mentioned. Yeah, um, um, Karl uh, Haushofer is sometimes mm -hmm. mentioned. Thomas Mann, you know, is sometimes brought up as a uh, as one of the main members of the conservative revolution. I mean, the author Thomas yeah. Mann. Yeah, Thomas Mann. Um. um you know, so I, I've had, when we talk about famous ones, I forget to mention him because uh, no one thinks about him as 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 associated. Um, but like, as far as defining characteristics are concerned, just so we have like sort of a working definition, mm -hmm. it's the, it's the idea that like there, it's a it's essentially it's a conservative modernism that is attempting to establish an authoritarian state and across the board they're agreed upon like Fuhrer principle right the mm -hmm. idea of the strong leader basically Otto von Bismarck is like the the er figure for what a leader should be for this movement right mm -hmm. and um he doesn't necessarily have to be aristocracy in fact like there's lots of conservative revolutionaries who think that the next chancellor the next you know kaiser figure that will supplant the kaiser idea is going to be from you know the the toiling classes or the middle class mm -hmm. um and there's the idea that there needs to be an implementation of german socialism which is a socialism a, a folkish socialism basically right. it's corporatism right uh, in it, this in this sense it is similar to italian fascism it is yes in, in fact like i mean arthur arthur muller vandenbroek is very explicitly inspired by Mussolini and the fascists, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think that uh, sort of fascist ideas get make their way into the zeitgeist of Germany, even though Hitler and the Nazis don't directly draw anything from the fascists. Mm -hmm. The uh, fascist ideas make their way into the zeitgeist through the conservative revolution. Um, yeah. And what's interesting about this to me is that conservative revolution starts to splinter even before the fascists come. I mean, Carl Smith, as we were talking about earlier, is the explicit fascist. He's also early on linked with these guys. Like, uh, and, and when he write like, the, a book that isn't read anymore because it's not as appropriable, The Dictator, um, in 1921, he sees himself as sympathetic to these conservative revolutionaries. Yeah. Um, and then later, people like... Um, Ernst uh, Nikish, uh, yeah, who's one of the first, you know, national Bolshevists, yeah, uh, also see these people as an important predecessor to what they're doing, even though they're right wing. Pe uh, what do they call themselves in German? Uh, 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 
Linka Lut von Rex, which is left wing people of the right, <laughs> which is a very strange yeah. uh, conception. Well, um, uh, I think it's. Um, uh, you could look von Rex. Ma- uh, Manfred von Killinger of mm. the Air- Earhart Brigade. He refers to him, him and his like the Earhart Brigade, like of uh, Freikorps, uh, as we Bolshevists of the right. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, and you you'll have uh, there is actually a kind of a little bit of a fluid crossover between um, Freikorps members who will abandon the Freikorps and join the communists, the Red Front, or actually, I think it's uh, whichever whichever Freikorps group was led by Beppo Romer, which joins the communists as a whole Freikorps unit. <laughs> it's very strange but like uh yeah i mean like Ernst sneakish and car Pedel, they um are very explicitly consi- they very like explicitly consider themselves bolsheviks right they yeah. uh, and, and, not just marxists but out now bolsheviks yeah and uh then but at the same time they're in the same they're part of the same milieu like the uni club mm-hmm. uh, in berlin which was founded by uh Muller Vandenbroek and some other people, which includes all of these people like uh, that we were just mentioning, like uh, Ernst Jünger and um, even uh, let's what's his name, um, Brunig of uh, the 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 Chancellor before uh, before von Papen and then Hitler, right, mm-hmm. it, uh, is in this circle as well, and they consciously think they that they are bolsheviks but want to resurrect folkish nationalism within german bolshevism right not resurrect but inject it right they yeah, think very, the, very george sorrow but that had not been a thing in germany <laughs> yeah um it's interesting that the the language that the national bolsheviks use like that's that uh like specifically um and sneakish uses is the idea that they need to wage a proletarian war for uh liberation of the territories that had been taken from them by france and poland in order to to reestablish the german borders because like, at this did they also use proletarian nation language the way that uh like early fascists did I, I don't think that at this point they did like in the early 1920s i don't think they did mm-hmm um, in fact, I, I don't think I've come across it, but the way that they see Germany is as a proletarian nation, right? Got it. Even if they don't explicitly use that terminology, like the, like the fascists did. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's actually pretty, it's, it's really fascinating to me to see this and, uh, you'll first, the communists see the nationalist language of the national Bolsheviks and they like eschew it. In fact, I think that's Nikish gets kicked out of the, the Communist Party, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, then, wait, was Nikish part of the Communist Party or was he SPD? He's SPD. SPD, yeah. He gets, I, does he get, I think he gets booted by the SP, SPD. Yeah, he gets but, booted by the SPD. And then yeah. he, he was even a member of the, of the, of the of the US today, which was the, yeah, the, the, the anti war split off. Right. Like, that's what I was thinking. Time. The right. independent social democrats right right yeah so he gets and anyway so like whenever he approaches the communists to try to like have... well, he reconciles with the with the with the marxist leninist government of of east germany too right he does after the war yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but whenever he approaches the communists at first he's rebuffed but then of course the the history of the common turn in the 1920s and their relationship to Germany is give you whiplash. If you try to follow mm-hmm. what their positions are first they're okay, sure. Yes. National Bolshevist language has a place. And then they're like, no, wait, no, it doesn't. Never mind. We're, we're against that. Oh wait, no, it has a place. Oh, we're against that. And then it's it definite. You could definitely see how people lost faith in the line of the common turn. Well, but that's interesting to me because they pull that stuff again in America in the nineteen in the late nineteen forties and fifties with like Balderism and the yeah. stuff. like like so the S the the SPUSA is doing the same turns in the forties and fifties that the that the the common turns trying to pull with the with the KPD mm-hmm. in the twenties and 
we don't learn. Well, <laughs> I'm just, just, just want to like point that out. Like, I mean, even someone who's considered with like with the you know someone linked to the left opposition, like Carl Raddick, gets angry yeah. in his face with this. And, well, I mean, Raddick is the Germany expert, and he's like his his maneuvering to try to to deal with the rise of national socialism is it's just totally inept and cynical as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like going so far as to like actually praise the Nazis for resisting the French in the Ruhr. And then actually inviting uh, Arthur Muller Vandenbroek to write a column in the, uh, the communist newspaper. Oof. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not so much as it, even you might be able to understand like combined strike actions or something like that, or some sort of just misunderstood United frontism where they're like, Oh, well you're socialists also. Maybe we can win you away from your anti-Semitism." but no, actually the, the, the way that they get into the bed with the, the right in Germany is it's actually pretty disheartening. You, you really realize that like if correct leadership is all that we need <laughs> to to win, then uh, we actually never had a chance. Yeah, that's that is disheartening. <laughs> um, but but and, and like I said, Radek is not a figure we generally associate with like the right end of the Bolsheviks or the right opposition or even, you know, Stalin. I mean, he's 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 firmly he's not a Trotskyist, but he's firmly yeah. in the left opposition. And yet he, there's so much uh egg in his face here. Zinoviev Zinoviev too uh for 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 he's also guiding the SP, uh not the SPD, the the KPD to do very strange things in this time period. Um and it gives I you think, whiplash. It's just yeah, back and forth, back and I, forth. And I think that's why we can't. I mean, what I saw today, the whole like debate about whether or not um, the USSR was really, really opposed to Nazis and Nazis really opposed them. And I'm like, yes and no, the entire time until like 1939. I mean, they're going back and forth, sometimes in the same year on some of these things, trying to figure out how to navigate it. Um, and that's true, not just during, frankly, not just during, you know, high Stalinism of the 30s. It's also mm -hmm. true in the 20s. Like, they do not know how to figure out um, what to do with these nationalist movements. Even though that, you know, the um, Bukharin's text, Lenin, they're pretty clear that they shouldn't be embracing these people. And yet they consistently kind of do. <laughs> So well, I mean, look at the Stalinist policy in the on the Kuomintang in China. It's it's similar. They actually prefer the Kuomintang to to the Maoists, right? I guess the I don't know if they they could consider themselves Maoists yet, right? But the Chinese Communist Party, because the Chinese Communist Party is seen as having too many anarchists in it, and it's, it's an unstable element, right? They wanted a stable neighbor to the south <laughs> that they could trade with that would be a bulwark against the Japanese, and the communists couldn't promise that, so they just dealt with the Kuomintang instead, and encouraged yeah. the communists to liquidate themselves into the Kuomintang, which yeah. put them at a disadvantage, and it, got like uh, you know five hundred thousand of them killed. <laughs> yeah, um, I was about to say a disadvantage in the civil war in the beginning, um, yeah. which they did overcome, but nevertheless, I, yeah. the, I think these things are are underexplored because they kind of, they're not they're not what liberal what liberals would often want to say that oh the, well it was horseshoe theory and the far left was supporting the far right against the center the whole time that's not true either no. um and it is also true that the bolsheviks and the fascists did view each other as enemies most of the time yeah i mean like but, it's not <laughs> yeah they they literally all throughout the you know, the 20s and the 30s were killing each other in the streets, right? But occasionally trying to use each other in strategic coalitions or come up with hybrid ideologies that could try to control one another. It was, it's a wild time. And we're not even factoring in what the SPD is doing to exacerbate all this during no. this time period. So, so like, I think we mentioned this on, on the a couple of episodes that we did about Weimar German communism's flirtation with national socialism. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about how, like I, you, you might be able to understand, uh, to, to understand how the communists looking at the Nazis 
were just like, yeah, I mean, sure, they're anti-Semitic. So is everyone on the right. But we've got to win them away from those ideas. Right. So c- doing coordinated actions to against the the, the French for occupying the Ruhr or uh, strikes, coordinating with uh, the National Socialists to support strike actions in Prussia in order to win Nazis away from the workers away from the Nazi party. It, it almost makes sense if you don't understand the nature of fascism, with, which I don't think that really mo- most people did at the time. Especially right. not the commentary well, no now either, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's that's a fair assertion. It's like, yeah, like you see, because it does superficially seem related to what you're doing. I mean, you might think of it as white deviationist, but then so are the social democrats, and these guys uh, are in opposition to the to the bourgeois government, where the social democrats are in league with them. I mean, I can see the logic actually, yeah. and. Which is why the logic comes up again and again in history. This doesn't just happen once. I mean, this goes to me, this goes back to the weird flirtations of Ferdinand Lafsal with the Bismarckian central state and, and yeah. goes up to now with the with the with this with the with the stupid advent of socialist alliance with national conservatives are socialists doing really stupid shit like promoting MAGA communism. Whatever. I really um, hope that that's just like five people that are too loud. I hope so too. But <laughs> we, I, I never know. Yeah. Like uh, with so many, the, so I did material, but it sees attention. It. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. So. So. Going into going into the 1920s, where are these guys at? Because you mentioned that a lot of them get killed by the Nazis, but a lot of like people like Carl Schmidt join them. Yeah, and then there's people like Thomas Mann are like uh, Ernst Jünger who are able to stay aligned to the National Conservative movement, kind of opposed the kind of opposed the government, um, but not you know not get themselves killed. Right. So, well, I mean, a lot of them see the nazis they're like look they're they're folkish they're they they have a concept of the you know harmonious volksgemeinschaft just like we do uh of course this is it's not it's not exactly what we wanted but it is a vehicle for getting something close to what we want and they join right Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of people say that the the conservative revolution helped soften the intellectual middle the the intellectual the the more educated middle class to the idea of Nazism, which I think there's a little bit of uh, truth to that, probably, mm-hmm. um, by prepping the groundwork, but, but by talking about a lot of the same things. Um, so a lot of the people that are involved in the conservative revolution move, revolutionary movement join the Nazis. And if you look at like the Stahlhelm, the Stahlhelm actually incorporates itself into the into the SA, right? Mm-hmm. And the Stahlhelm was they had it produced a newspaper that Ernst Jünger wrote for in the in the 20s so like yeah a good chunk of them go into the nazi party and then a good chunk of them just keep their mouth shut and go along to get along the way that ernst Jünger did you know Mm -hmm. um and then a few of them end up in concentration camps not necessarily killed but like they do end up in concentration camps and some of them do get killed yeah so how does that happen like who are the ones that end up in concentration camps um let's see i have my notes right here in which i wrote down a couple of these people um the one specifically that I was thinking of was uh there we go. Franz Schoenfecker, who uh is actually the guy that came up or he reintroduced the term conservative revolution into the the Weimar lexicon. And he actually writes the speech that Franz von Papen gives once the the Nazis um, really start showing their true colors, right? After the Night of the Long Knives and stuff like that. And uh, at the all of the extrajudicial killings and disappearings that get done he he writes a speech for von poppen and ends up getting thrown in a concentration camp for it um uh, there's half a dozen other ones but like that i that are listed 
but the, he's the one famous one that I know that actually goes to the concentration camp for it. Hmm. That's that's uh, well disheartening for him. Um, so the so. One of the things I think it, there's a tendency to do amongst people trying to justify the conservative revolution as, you know, the, the, the better counterpart to the Nazis and not as reactionary is um, to use people like that who went, ended up in the, in the camps. Um, uh, who, who, who else is really associated with the conservative opposition to, to the fascist that was originally linked to this movement? Um... So, well, I mean, I guess Spengler is right. He, mm -hmm. he, he defies Hitler quite explicitly and then writes a lot uh, against Hitler in coded language while uh, the Nazis are rising to power and in power. Right. And he kind of gets away with it. Nothing really happens to him because... Right. Yeah. Is that similar to Thomas Mann who also takes yeah. an opposition? Um, Thomas although... Mann does. Yeah, although he really cuts ties with the conservative revolutionaries too. So. Yeah, well, I mean, and Ernst Jünger does as well. Ernst Jünger writes very vague, uh, in, very vaguely against the Nazis, and mm -hmm. also refuses to join the party, right? And uh, rather than go to prison or uh, concentration camp, he joins the military. And uh, so his brother does as well, um, Ernst Dinger's brother, who uh, – what is Ernst Dinger's brother? Friedrich Georg Junger? I don't, I don't remember his, his name. Um, but, yeah, he does as well. Um, yeah, that's his name. I was right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So to kind of backtrack a little bit, how much does World War II solidify that? I mean, not World War II, World War I solidify this movement? Because um, that's really the beginning of German socialism. Um, and we've kind of jumped ahead when we talked about the National Bolsheviks, but German socialism is clearly a predecessor to that. Mm -hmm. And if you read some like, there's, for example, there's a, there's a Oswald Spengler text where he's like almost... <laughs> Almost writing homoerotically about August Babel and the Marxist. And yeah, things. yeah. Like, um, he but he is inspired by them, even though he right. disagrees with them. Yeah, yeah but yeah, but, and so he, he that's when you, that's the first time I ever saw the phrase German socialism, and I didn't really know the context for what he was talking about. I knew it wasn't Marxian socialism, and I knew it wasn't Nazism, although the National Socialist element of it does sound very similar. I mean, German socialism, national socialism, and it's, it's related, yeah. but um, how does this come out of World War One in particular? Well, you've got concepts of German socialism that go back to Fichte, like mm -hmm. the way that Fichte describes the ideal, you know, German society. It's very much like some sort of like vaguely defined national socialism, right? He doesn't use those terms, but the way he describes it, it's just like, very socially conscious Volksgemeinschaft, right? And it that makes its way through all of the the, the folkish writers of the 19th century who, I mean, because if you look at where folk, the, the folkish nationalist movement comes from, it comes out of the failed expectations of the revolution of 1848, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are, there's, there are liberal foundations to folkish nationalism and it has a social component within it that uh, never goes away. And you look at our, uh, our authors from like the, the late 19th, early 20th century before the war, like Julius Longben and um, uh, Paul Lagarde, they they talk about like a socialism, a German form of socialism, a German form of like uh, just social welfare, looking out for people's uh, fighting against the excesses of modernity and capitalism like specific they call it manchesterism right like the proletari proletarianization and industrialization that's that's all there there are undercurrents within the the folkish movement before world war one and of course like like you mentioned um it's it's got it's it's also got roots in 
uh, LaSalle. It's also got roots in Bismarck's idea of state socialism, as it's called by its opponents, right? Um, and it seems to have a lot of stuff pulled strictly from Karl Haushofer. Yeah. You know, like, like his ideas about um, uh, Liebenstrom and well, organic state and pan-regional unity and stuff. Well, Haushofer is incredibly influential to the Nazis. Uh, yeah, I mean, Haushofer is influential to like the entire right. Right, exactly. But I, I believe that it was uh, um, was Rudolf Hess, Karl Haushofer's student. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When it, whenever he met Hitler, and uh, I think I channeled a lot of Haushofer's ideas directly into Hitler. But uh, I think that um, when you get to when you get to World War One, you've got the the what's referred to as the Oberost on the Eastern Front, right? Which is run by Erich Ludendorff, and the Oberost is a, the German military command economy that exists. It's an ex extractive command economy that's in a process of like Germanization of. Uh, uh, portions of the Eastern Front that they had taken from the Russians mm -hmm. during the war. And they have this utopian ideas about a military socialism that was led by, you know, the, was structured, the, the society was structured by the military command economy with goods produced for the purpose of uh, fulfilling the needs of the people and the military, all directed by the state. And you have like utopian ideas being born out of that. And those make their way back into um, into Germany after the war as well. And then there's always like what I mentioned before, the idea of like trenchocracy or trench socialism as well, where people like Ernst Jünger write about this a lot, about the, the, the differences between classes just going away when right. you're on the battlefield because – you know, the aristocracy and the working class and the middle class, they all bleed exactly the same. And if you're, if you're willing to die it's for your really brothers. It's really funny to write that, though, about people in an army that's based on the Prussian, like the Prussian yeah. aristocratic yeah, army exactly. form. Exactly. Like, where all the, all the officers are aristocracy, you can literally buy into it. Well, but, but the, uh, the, the Nazis actually take that very seriously. Um, mm. The Nazis have this perverted idea of meritocracy where like you could be, you could work your way through the military and become a, uh, a high ranking officer just by being good enough. Right. And um, mm -hmm. they take that idea seriously and that makes its way into the conservative revolution as well. So I would say that the, the world war one plays the, the, the point of concentration for all of these ideas to come together because it's, making sense of the defeat of world war one, trying to salvage something from that uh, mm -hmm. is one of the, the key projects of the conservative revolution. It's like, how do we, how do we as new nationalist revolutionaries think of the sacrifice that we made? What is it? And it, there, there's a bunch of different ideas, but the, uh, probably the most famous one is going to be Ernst Jüngers, which is, it's like the idea of dying for the fatherland is sacred. It's like, and the idea of like fighting in a war is, is its own sort of reward, right? Its own sort of like um, spiritual refinement, and it it gives meaning to it gives meaning to the German society because it sort of coalesced this group of brothers together that will be forged in this crucible and set loose in order to build a new society, and it's uh, just by the the process of being in war. Uh, has its own sort of like spiritual reward to it. It's very, very weird, mystical sort of German nonsense that there's, you, there's a lot of misty eyed sort of idealism that doesn't ever go away. And that that's a big part of the German, Revo uh, the conservative revolution as well. But I would say that, yeah, it's the world war one that plays the, the downfall, the, the removal of the idea of the, the need for the Kaiser, but still never getting rid of this idea that you need a strong leader. Right. And in, in many ways, it's similar to how the the French Revolution. I mean, it, it, that's an internal civil war and a mm -hmm. revolution. But how the French Revolution sets the tone for uh, the first reactionary, like real reactionary movement, because they because yeah. they want to differentiate themselves from the Ancien Regime, which they saw as weak, and 
allowed for you know the need for the revolutionaries in the mind of people like uh Demestra for coming in and like act, enacting the will of God, getting rid of these weak, decadent yeah uh rulers. Um the and, first dissident right wing movement, right? Right, right, yeah. exactly. And and I think that notion of the dissident right versus the status quo right is useful for understanding a lot of these movements, except they get it gets really confusing when said dissident right is related to another faction of said dissident right that happens to actually take power. Right. And that is the case, you know, that's the well, case. I mean, that's with, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> with, that's how it, the, that's how it goes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then yeah. you, you, you kind of see where it splits. I mean, I've mentioned, um, uh, Karl Haushofer, but Karl Haushofer, uh, his son, Albrecht is, even though he was protected by, by uh, Adolf Hes by Rudolf Hess himself, right? Um, Albrecht is uh, implicated in a plot to kill Hitler. Yeah, um, and he he's one of the people who dies with you know in an American context because we all like Christian martyrs. He's one of the people who dies with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah, um, and, and we see we see all this like because this is a very weird and mixed up time, and. And I think one of the things that, that the conservative revolutionaries really point out, I think if they had won out and not Hitler, we wouldn't have quite as weird of a notion of fascism in the United States where we think everything is Hitlerism because, yeah. because even from the fascist perspective, the Hitler Nazis weird. Nazism is weird. Yeah. It's, it's really funny. You, you come across this a lot in the scholarship on it. Uh, like, one of the books that I read recently was talking about how, oh, you can't really consider the German, the, the, the conservative revolution, um, uh, nationalist fashion. They don't have of, uh, biological racism. And I was like, well, yet yeah, neither did most of the other fascists. Right. Uh, <laughs> it, it, in fact, like Nazism is so weird. It's really an outlier in fascist movements. The weirdest is the uh, the Iron Guard. Yeah, right? they're the weirdest. But the Nazism is very weird. It's it is definitely an outlier, and it it sh it's shares key characteristics with other fascist movements. But the things that make it different are not shared at all by any of the other ones. So it really shouldn't be a baseline for what we consider fascism. Right. It, it is a. It is the. I mean, it is the specifically racialist deviant as opposed to ethnicist. Mm -hmm. uh the anti-semitism is is endemic to german society and it's endemic to a lot of the right all over the world yeah but it's specific biological version of anti-judaism um that doesn't even allow for assimilation yeah. is kind of unique um yeah a lot of the the, fol the folkish anti-semitism from like the early 20th century and the late 19th century is assimilationist they they think that like Jews are only bad because they refuse to be Germanized, right? right? And, that, and that's actually what Otto Strasser thinks as well. Like that's one of the, the one of the points where he breaks away from uh, from Hitler uh, is the, he thinks that anti-Semitism is just like it's a distraction from what the real issue is. And Hitler uses anti-Semitism as his. Uh, rather than the bourgeoisie as as the as the enemy that needs to be expropriated it's you know the unproductive bourgeoisie meaning right. jewish speculators and bankers and stuff like that yeah i think people even uh, i get really really worried when we have unproductive talk and it seems to be tied to specific ethnic groups or kinds of people because i'm <laughs> like that's historically been a a sign um yeah. Um, even though I, I think you can take it too far in the Moshe Postone arena where you like, we can't talk about banking as a problem in capital anymore because that's structurally anti-Semitic. I think that's, that's kind of ridiculous, but yeah, I've um, actually seen that tweeted unironically by Libs on uh, Twitter whenever they were criticizing Corbyn and Sanders. That, that it's great when like liberals call Sanders anti-Semitic. It's pretty hilarious. Um, so yeah, I, I, I this, so I get why, you know, I, I get why people might have issue with, with, with that being a rubric, but the, the, the productivist talk is usually a cow. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so to dig back into this a little bit, though, there's a lot here to, to kind of parse, and and it's more than we can parse in one episode because this is all happening while the SP day is in chaos. Um, we've already talked about the chaos of the KP day. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I think people miss about the Nazis is their ability to come to power is partly because of this sheer entropy, seemingly, in the Weimar Republic's inability to like form a coherent government. Um, how much does the context of Weimar play into these conservative revolutionaries? Like what are they, what is, what is their response to the Weimar Republic? I mean, it's probably, it's like one of the only reasons they exist is to oppose the Weimar Republic. Right. Like Mm -hmm. that's the, the, as far as generally conservative revolutionaries are against the idea of having a party program. Um, Mm -hmm. They, they toy around with trying to make one on and off and they criticize the Nazis for having one. Um, but like, um, they never quite get it down. But one of the things that they can all agree on is that the Weimar Republic is bad and needs to go away. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. what's going to replace it. They don't really know, which is why they, they sort of like focus on the fear principle, the idea that the, the leadership principle, right. The idea that the one person that, uh, that represents the people of Germany is going to be. Uh, the whatever the program is is going to be whatever this person implements, right? But yeah, it's just I mean that's the the Weimar Republic is basically the one of the only things that they can all agree on is that it needs to end. It's seen as decadent and corrupt and um, bringing in Anglo-Saxon influences, right? Western influences. They're against the Westernization of Germany. It's funny to th- to not think of Germany as the West. But, you know, a lot of Germans didn't think of themselves as the West. They thought of themselves as separate from the West and really, really resented. Yeah. Going all the way back to Tacitus, like to to their readings of Tacitus, they see themselves as separate. (laughs) I've been like, like, I've been obsessed with the way that the the 1848ers up into the the Nazis used Tacitus to 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 like construct a german identity and i think people miss this now because like for example um we think of of the greeks as old dead white guys yeah you know why we think of the greeks i mean i know you do but the average person (laughs) does not know why we think of the greeks as old dead white guys and not like proto arabs um is explicitly that to counter Anglo obsession with Rome and in French obsession with Rome, that the Germans turn to uh, turn their philology to Greece as part of their national consolidation project, as part of their like, well, we're the Eastern answer, uh, we're the Eastern European answer to, you know, the Anglo Roman Western man. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you really look at the the center of German government, it's in Prussia, right? Right which is like the, the eastern portion of Prussia is now Poland. And it's stretched all the way up the Baltic. I mean, it's like Germany has been oriented eastward for a majority of its history. It's only like in the post-war world that it hasn't been. And I mean, and that that's the, the idea of uh, Lebensraum from the Haushofer, right? And through Hitler that the, the Germans' destiny lies in the east. And yeah, that's actually decide the Slavs to do that, but right, <laughs> that wasn't always part of it. But like the idea of the the wild East, where Germans can go and make their make their fortune, is something that really captivated the Fry Corps as well when they went out to the Baltic states to fight against the Bolsheviks. Right, right. Um, I've always wondered how much like the the Volga Germans and um, the Germans in Bohemia, you know, were were part of of this idea. Um, and as things soured in the late 19th century with with Russia, like with Russia and with many of the Volga Germans being exposed, expelled back to the West, how this played in, I, 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 I imagine it had to play something. And we also have to remember that like Germany wasn't a unified nation until like, you know, the end uh, of the 19th century. century. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's actually of the springtime of nations, it's one of the last ones to finish consolidating. Yeah. And, and 
arguably doesn't because Austria never gets incorporated. Right, right. Oh, and that's funny about the idea of the Anschluss, right? The unification of the Austrian and German uh, nations is something that used to be a left-wing idea. It's starting in 1848, or, you know, it was one of the projects of 1848 was the unification of the all of the German-speaking peoples. Uh, and uh, when when it becomes part of the Treaty of Versailles, that that's not allowed to happen anymore. It becomes an exclusively right-wing idea because, like, you know, the SPD defends Versailles and defends the Weimar Republic and doesn't want to unify. And then the only people that actually do are the extremes, and it mm. becomes a right-wing demand. But, yeah, it's always... It was, it, like, if you look at literature about the East in Germany in the 19th century specifically, it's seen like the way that Americans see the Wild West, right? It's this like wild place that you can go and make your fortune. You can go and have adventures. And you go and carve out your own little piece of land and, and be a settler. Like Heinrich Himmler in his diaries wrote a lot about how he wanted to go be a farmer in Russia get land and be a farmer in Russia. And this is even like after the revolution and stuff. So I'm not exactly sure what he thought he was going to do there, but like, yeah, it's, it's this captivation that it's this captivating idea of like frontier land that you can go and just have yeah. and defend against the hordes of like barbarian Slavs. And yeah. I mean, it, right. it really, it really plays into the idea that like when Germany goes to conquer Russia and starve 30 million Slavs in order to create Lebensraum. It's all they're doing is what the United States did to the Native Americans and what the British did to the Indians. Right, and this is this is also something that makes German fascism a little different, and it's going to make Americans uncomfortable, is how much of the of the Nazi ideology in particular... I mean, there's, there's American influences on, on Mussolini too, but, but yeah. in particular pull from... Western expansionism and Jim Crow explicitly as models. Yeah. Um, like now they, they go. F- oh, and American uh, uh, eugenics as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, though, eugenics is one of those things that, that until the Nazis is actually a pan ideological uh, movement. So there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was definitely part of American democracy for, uh, right. about a century i mean almost. the the, Ameri- but the american right and the american left even when the american left was not being racialist all right uh like you think about people like um uh gilman uh, uh charlotte gilman um uh, charlotte the writer of the yellow wallpaper and you know the radical feminist who wrote like the the herland and the feminist socialist utopia yeah uh, she was a eugenicist you know she was not a anti. She didn't. She didn't talk about you know exterminating races, but she was definitely talking about like breeding for better, you know, for more peaceable people. This idea was. This idea was common, and actually, it's interesting to me that Marx and Engels, for their love of Darwin, and <laughs> their tendency to to have ideal types of. Of nation groups. That's the fun thing about the private letters of Marx and Engels is how much yeah. they're just slagging on everybody. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, including the Czechs, which are considered a non-historic people. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, are, are the are the English who are historic but made dumb by being on an island? Um, you know, <laughs> Anglo-Saxon barbarism, etc. Um, yeah, but. But in all seriousness, I mean, we can joke about the soft bigotry of Marx and Engels. Um, uh, they don't adopt eugenics frameworks, and it's actually kind of a miracle that they don't, because almost everybody else does, regardless of whether they're left or right. Yeah. The only people who don't are Christians. So, <laughs> and even some of them do. But, like, like, usually opposition from eugenics is, like, from people like William Jenny Bryant, who are, like, progressive fundamentalist Christians. Yeah, yeah, um, it's funny. It's because the 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 denominations that are considered to be the the most liberal and left leaning now are the ones who eat eugenics up uh, in the in the nineteen uh, in the nineteenth and early twentieth well, yeah. century, like the Episcopalians and the Methodists. And, totally, totally, yeah. and 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 re- conversely, uh, the Anabaptists, the Baptists, the 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 the, the proto fundamentalist movement and the fundamentalist movement are the people who are the 
least amenable to eugenics and they're also the least amenable to the state in in the 19th century it's funny how that's all flipped yeah Uh, yeah. um uh catholics too because of that sticking point they have about you know their universal church and life being sacred yeah yeah well i mean here's the thing also some of these eugenics groups they were not negative eugenicists they were just pro sterilization yeah so they which is also a, a really really bad uh, the Catholics are really against that as well. That's a no-no right. to Catholics. Yeah, right. So the Catholics end up being good on this, but the, wh- why I point this out is like after World War II, the 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 arrangement of these of like some of these things that we that seem so essential to us are essential to fascism, but are like kind of endemic to the political landscape, uh, get washed away, you know, in the response. Um, eugenics being one of them. Um, uh, another thing that really, you know, uh, monarchies and authoritarian leaders kind of being another, um, but let's, cont- let's, let's really think about what happens to these guys. So, so one of the things I'm finding interesting about, as we talk about them, their refusal to draw up a program seems to be a weakness that keeps people from, for, for, that keeps them from being able to maintain a separate identity from other right-wing political groups. Yeah, and their their refusal to draw up a program, and they have this emphasis on activism. Funnily enough, which you can draw all the parallels you want to there, <laughs> without me having to say anything about it, is they have this sort of voluntarist activism, refusal to drop a program, and voluntarist activism, which really like neuters them. It really keeps them from being able to like, uh, you know hold their own in the marketplace of ideas or whatever, which is dominated by the Nazis and the communists. It's uh, it's actually really funny. I was just reading this book uh, relatively recently. I, I'm well, actually probably more like a year ago. Kept the notes that I was where the American just if, if as far as it, the impotence of a movement being primarily just it's basis in lofty ideas uh, with a, a utter rejection of concrete way of getting anything done. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that it sounds a lot like David Graeber. <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace. May he rest in peace. Uh, yeah. uh, man, I, I shouldn't throw too much shit on David Graeber, but uh, in some seriousness, I like the, 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 the occupation and the, the uh, and this or that is is the political movement itself, not the means to achieve the political movement. We don't have demands. We don't make a program. Uh, it is similar, actually, to to this movement. Um, Occupy everything, demand nothing. Right, like yeah. it it is similar to this because one of the things I think that we have to deal with is while there are. Uh, political economic implications to the conservative revolutionaries by and large it's a culturalist project yes um, i mean it's the the people that are the leaders of the movement are writers almost exclusively right that the way they influence the world is by writing about things and that's all they yeah. do just write writers novelists it's mostly novelists are the big ones and you have yeah. professors uh uh who you know and it's not that these people didn't do things. I mean, a lot of them were soldiers, uh, but yeah, a lot of them were soldiers, and, and a lot of them were like, like I mentioned, being part of the Stahlhelm, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the the biggest veterans organization in the country. Uh, they they were doing stuff. They were out there on the streets uh, demonstrating, and you know, I don't I don't think that Ernst Jünger was out there getting his hands dirty, but you know, the organization that he was attached to definitely was. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing that we have to to deal with, and I think why I'm so fascinated with this, and I know we, we've we covered it very cursorily for an hour, and uh, like when I talked about uh, when you started studying this, I was like, oh, I needed to talk to you about this because I did like ten years ago, I did this uh, three part series on fascist culture and fascist aesthetics, and. I remember fighting with uh, Arya Moedamam, um, who's a friend of mine, but like we, he wanted to call the conservative revolutionaries fascists. And I'm like, not really. 
like not I mean, there in the, are, not some in the shared German territory. context, but yeah. there's also you also can't say they're not. This is the other thing where mm-hmm. this is where a lot of you know like author, authoritarian you writist of what I would call post fascist um are yeah. you know are new new nationalists or whatever you want to call them um those that fall within the post-fascist matrix, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Which I tra- traverse those terminology, I think, is incredibly useful. Right. Um, a lot of them want to use the fact that these people weren't Nazis to distance themselves from the Nazis, and mm-hmm. I can even think of uh, like uh, a fair, a fairly recent book by um, by Paul Gottfried on fascism, where he tries to argue that Nazism isn't fascism and well, is Brazilian integralism and Italian fascism really so bad? Like that's that's his argument, <laughs> you know. Well, yes, yes, it, yes, it, it is really <laughs> so bad. Especially but, because Italian fascism has a, an incredibly racist view of Ethiopians and like gases it's them. It's just okay with, with Jews. Yeah, it's like. Well, I mean, at first it is. Once it starts aligning its racial policies with the Third Reich, it gets not anymore. Right. Well, well, that's just it. Like that tells you what you need to know, Mm -hmm. because while it is, I mean, while there, there are key, there are key Jewish thinkers who are in the Italian fascist. Well, Jews are overrepresented in the fascist party. Absolutely. They, yeah, they're part of a uh, disaffected middle class that sees uh, the fascist party as a vehicle for stability and prosperity and and national unity and strength again. Right. Right. And, and that probably would have happened in Germany too if if the Germans had not taken such an explicitly anti-Semitic. I mean, yeah, there would have been a World War II, or probably not a World War II. There would have been another war where Germany got their asses whipped by the French and the. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. This is a uh, speculation, but uh, yeah, I mean, there would have been another war, and there would have probably been have been another authoritarian government in Germany, but it would have been. Something that looks a lot like the Italian government. Right. I, would, I, I think that you can look at figures in the conservative revolution, specifically off the top of my head is Arthur Muller Vandenbroek, and say, yeah, they're basically homegrown German fascists. Not Nazis, nothing like that, but more along the lines of like, they have this explicitly corporatist idea mm-hmm. and the idea of like bridging right and left through uh, a, a new form of non-materialist socialism. Right. Right? Anyone who talks about bridging right and left is a right winger. Yes. Like, like, just like, I, I, I yeah. know that's very us or them logic and I'm not normally given to that, but yeah. like historically speaking, if you start talking about, well, right dissidents and left dissidents have some coalitionary interest against the center. Yeah. Well, the right dissidents are going to use the left dissidents and then kill them later. That's what happens. Like, that doesn't just happen either in the fascist context. You can also see the Islamist left coalitions where this happens. You can see it. I mean, it just happens over and over again. Yeah. I mean, like uh, Muller Vandenbroek is, he basically says like the November revolution was a good thing, uh, you know, and Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg are admirable figures, but they didn't take things far enough. They didn't, you know, the, the SPD basically, took a revolutionary movement and watered it down. It's the same thing the communists say, right? Mm -hmm. But what he is very explicitly wants some sort of uh, Aufhebung of right and left, right? He, uh, he, Muller Vandenbroek is studies Hegel vaguely has ideas about like, he, he's a right Hegelian essentially. Yeah. Just like Giovanni and child is later. I mean, Giovanni and child starts off as a, I mean, Lenin praises his work on Hegel. People forget this, but um, this is what sets up a lot of this weird stuff. I think it's interesting. I don't think the people who are doing this today know anything about these people if they're not part of the European New Right, right? Like, are, are there not like weird internet national Bolsheviks who live in someone's basement and have studied this because yeah. you know that's what you did? The, but the fact that this idea and this strategy keeps bubbling up in a time of economic crisis does seem interesting to me and the fact that the class basis of it um it it isn't people try to say it's petit bourgeois it it, it is and isn't 
um, when you know you study the class basis of these movements, the, the leaders tend to be petit bourgeois. That's the that's the main. Yeah. But they tend to be downwardly mobile petit bourgeois. Yeah. They tend to be what we might call the non-proletarian working poor. It's interesting. Um, the the leadership of the move of both of this and most communist movements, it's the same same class. Same people. Yeah. <laughs> and they hang out together, and yeah. they're in the same major cities. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's also true today. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> so. Um, it's a it's a bad thing having your petty bourgeois be downloadly mobile. <laughs> yeah, it's apparently a bad thing for stability anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and basically the if the petty bourgeois is gonna be left or right is like is it urban or rural? <laughs> like it's pretty much the, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. predicting value. Um you know, I, I mean th there's more complicated things to it, but that's why I wanted to talk about this. And I, I think we're gonna come back and maybe maybe um, in the future, do episodes on specific people because it's easier yeah. to see when we're not trying to talk about this large, really diverse. I mean, that is one of the weird things about the the conservative revolutionary movement. It's more diverse than the than the fascist than the yeah. The well, absolutely. Movement. We we really should do uh, like a, a folkish nationalist like sort of proto. German Revolution sort of precursor as well because this is all these ideas are just floating around. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We, yeah. We, we haven't even gotten to the, like, d don't think the French are off the hook. The French actually contribute more to the intellectual theories of all this than probably anybody else does. Well, um, that's that's the route that uh, you know um, the route. The French that and the white German. I mean, the and the Russian rights are like, are like actually where a lot of these ideas come from too. But yeah. Um. I well, mean, like, it, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say like the. Italian fascism has its birth in French, the French trying to come to terms with uh, new ways to motivate the working class, right? Like Italian fascism is born um, with, uh, I'm not going to say it's, it's explicitly Sorel's fault, but the Italian fascists are basically start off as uh, Sorelian national syndicalists, mm -hmm. right? But so, like, yeah, that the that's a whole separate, incredibly interesting pathway that the Italians take, and it's it's different than the Germans. But like I mentioned, there is cultural and intellectual interchange between the fascist movement and the um, conservative revolutionaries. Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting. I think I think one of the interesting differences, though, is. You know, we're always trying to blame liberals. We're always trying to blame this out or the other for, for, for fascism. And in some ways, all of it's true. But there is a real sense in which a whole lot, of uh, particularly the Italians' leadership, not their base. They have a different base. But their mm -hmm. leadership really does come from defectors from the socialist movement. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Like the, the syndicalist movement specifically. Right in uh, in uh, northern Italy, and uh, you know Mussolini, of course, was the editor of the the socialist newspaper, and uh, then like Nicola Bombacci, who is actually like a uh, uh, a communist before he joins the fascists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, a, a lot of the fascists of the first hour, as they called them, uh, were mostly socialists and syndicalists. Yep. You know, who, whose first experiment with this was national syndicalism, and then we go on from there. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, it's it, if you look at what national syndicalism is, it's it, like it starts off as like the idea that you, you want to build a corporate state in order to industrialize Italy, but mitigate the exploitation. Right. You don't right? want to have to do like ink and development, for example. Yes. So it starts off as a relatively benign sounding project. Right. How do we have capitalism without having it be how do we have the, the industrialization of capitalism without it killing the workers and immiserating the workers like it did in England? Well, well it's, we'll have a, a national deve a nationalist developmental state that bring in, that brings in, a, you know, a corporatist model to to help build the means of production and uh, accumulate without exploiting the workers too much. But then. It just grows from there. It, it does the thing that nationalism does, which is become malignant and expansionist. Um, yeah, and then, then you have the ideas of proletarian nationhood. They don't go away. The, yeah, they don't. <laughs> no, they come. I, 
that shit always comes back and yeah. and i think by the time you get into the 1950s and like the soviets are looking for another way to justify what they're doing without triggering world war three yeah uh proletarian nationhood and national liberation become the prime means for them to do it but that gets them in another in another cul-de-sac because they start having support bourgeois governments again yeah and it's like we and it really does feel like well i get why we made this decision strategically but by making a a a virtue of necessity we are literally making the same mistake over and over and over again for a hundred years yeah like um but yeah so we'll, we'll come back who knows we might even turn this as a part of our no royal world series to talk about all the nationalisms um well i mean like happened. that's the next step right like after we did the transition from in, into feudalism now we did the transition out, out, of out of feudalism and that part of that a big part of that's got to be nationalism now that is how you break up the 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 early absolutist mm-hmm. empires like yeah um well, on that note, we're going to stop and...